Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you back to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. I just put a link in the chat room, and let me read it. It's beam2eng.blogspot.com, and it's a link to an article that I've been coming back to from time to time. It's a great article. It has tremendous importance. I have been working to try to understand this on and off over time. The, f- the following are some phrases from the article that seem to be entering into my stream of conscious. Sometimes the Meyer information comes to me in small steps or phrases initially and then slowly builds up over time to a clearer understanding. There's one phrase in the article And this article, by the way, is called, um, well, The Source of the Oneness of the Universe. And there's a phrase in there that says, embrace the power within yourself and use it for yourself. And that really caught my eye today. I've been meditating on that. The, The power within is a phrase that I've seen used in other Meyer writings. Uh, Here is an example, and it comes from the Meditation from Clear Visibility book. It says, the creational natural power is within myself, and I use this putting it into effect in my thinking and my acting. So there's some power that's related to the universe that is available to us if we can just tap into it and if you've listened to this show before, you know I've spent a good deal of time in the, the Might of Thoughts book. And there's another concept which is related to this called the fine fluidal forces, which I'm going to talk about shortly. But even in Sfaf's explanation in line 70, it talks about the oneness of creation. It says, however, this oneness and connectedness with all and everything is the result of the might and the immeasurable love of creation, which gives everything selflessly and demands no payment for it. The oneness and the flow of creation is also described in bulletin number 38, special bulletin number 38. And... This bulletin comes from a reader question where the reader asks the term, what is the term supernatural, and what exactly is that, and how does it function? So in the process of explaining that, uh, Billy said the following. He said, the vibrations, energies, and their power consist of tiny, fine material, respectively fluidal, units of information which individually and collectively consists constitute a oneness and which through like the electrical current through wires flow in an invisible form through the brain and through the body to finally leave these and to reach out into the environment and into the ether from which they are picked up by sensitive humans, respectively by humans who have at their disposal the ability of fine material perception. So as you can imagine, I think this is just the beginning of the tip of a very large iceberg. But I'll I'll read just a little bit of Figu Bulletin 38 to you that deals with Um, what is supernatural. It says, the answer to your question turns out to be quite extensive since the whole matter cannot simply be made clear within a a few words. So I will satisfy your interest 
with a part of a lesson from the spiritual teaching in which the following is explained. Supernatural, respectively, fine matter, respectively, fluidal forces. The term supernatural is an incorrect word which is utilized to describe something perceptible which for the human lies beyond that of the normal material, that is to say, beyond the coarse material realm, and thereby beyond the material material observation capabilities, therefore rather in the realm of fine material. To designate that which is of fine matter, the fluidal, as supernatural is fundamentally wrong, because truthfully there is nothing which lies beyond the perception of the human senses. That's an astounding statement. Let's continue. Rather, only something which belongs outside the coarse material realm in the realm of fine matter. In particular, the talk is thereby in regard to the effect of fine matter, thought vibrations, which in their fine matter form are designated as fluidal energies and fluidal forces, and which through engendered through the thoughts and feelings, also yield outside of the brain various effects which can be perceived by other humans. These fluidal energies and their forces are not only the energies relating to telepathy, levitation, teleportation, rather also those of clairvoyance and remote viewing whereby for every particular factor, forms of phenomena occur which are individually different for each human. With the reading of thoughts and with actual telepathy and all other neurophysiological factors, alpha waves play a big role, as with meditation, because these flow in the thought current synchronously, through both hemispheres of the brain, whereby they are also active within the processing of pictures and pictorial imaging, images, as also the case under hypnosis and in trance through which the brain switches to the so-called alpha mode. Thoughts and feelings do not only course through the brain, rather they also work beyond it and can be transmitted In the form of telepathy across three light seconds, around 900,000 kilometers, and can be received and understood by another suitable brain. And because feelings also arise from thoughts, for this reason humans can also feel it when they suddenly lose or have lost someone who they love, in the same way that they also suddenly know that they are needed by a human who lives far away or in the vicinity. Also a look which bores into the back, a glass breaking inexplicably, or an object falling without reason. Appern to that. As a rule, the reason for that is a particular human's strong thought currents and the fine matter, electromagnetic light speed vibrations, respectively fluidal energies that come from them. The human momentarily directs his strong thoughts at a certain person or persons who then perceives these vibrations and recognizes what is transmitted thereby. So fluidal energies free themselves from a human through strong thought currents which are perceived by certain connected humans and are grasped as a hunch or correctly interpreted. And I've talked before about these uh, electromagnetic energies, the swinging wave, as it's discussed in the book called The Psyche. And from the what's called the gemut, or the, the part of our spiritual consciousness that 
yeah, the controlling part of our spiritual consciousness. The gamut can utilize the swinging wave. It sends the swinging wave the electromag- from the electromagnetic realm of life to the psyche. And, and as it said in our article there, this leads to things like telepathy, levitation, teleportation, clairvoyance, remote viewing. So these fine fluido energies are extremely important. Um, So we have a material consciousness realm, and I'm going a little bit off topic here, and a spiritual consciousness. The material consciousness realm, the material consciousness itself can, can become disturbed. However, contrary to the unvulnerable, untouchable spirit, which represents a purely creational product in its form and power as well as in its swinging wave. So the spirit form is a purely creational power. And we're talking about this article that says the source of oneness of the universe, which tells us to embrace the power within yourself and use it for yourself. And I imagine it may be referring to these swinging waves and to the actual spirit form which can harness these swinging waves. The swinging waves, again, are electromagnetic swinging waves in the teaching of the spirit which are periodically built up electrical and magnetic forces which are not bound to any matter but nonetheless include energies and untold forces which can be of immense might. So that is the swinging wave, which um, is also discussed in the Goblet of Truth, but in a slightly different way. It There's this passage which I continually quote from because it kind of summarizes so many things about creation. It's called What the Truth Knows to Say, and it says... River stones, plants, bushes, trees, uh, everything that crawls and flies on the earth is a life form with a spirit form. And these spirit forms are on a journey through time, which involve many, many lifetimes. And that death is just the passage into the world of pure spirit. That's fine matter, as our article said. And many of these creatures are aware of each other and connected by the psychic swinging wave. And you can always watch a school of birds as they move together. And they're connected together. They they sit together on signs and fence posts and in trees. And animals use this uh, swinging wave just through the function of their uh, instinct. And it's part of how they operate. And if we were closer to nature and the world around us, we would also use these swinging waves. So, boy, I've touched on just a gigantic iceberg of information here. And I hope we'll certainly come back to it. I have to take it in little chunks and try to digest it and dissect it and understand it all. I want to jump back for just a second to Contact Report 260 and talk a little bit again about Adolf Hitler. Um, One of the things I wanted to touch on again was the Dark Order, which is called the New World Order in our alternative media. Uh, Adolf Hitler was a German politician. He was the leader of the Nazi Party. He was the Fuhrer of Nazi Germany from 1934 to 1945. Uh, He was in many respects a genius. The Meyer material says that he, by his nature, was destined to be a very positive world leader. And in fact, the Playaren were sending him telepathic uh, impulses to help him. Uh, fulfill that destiny. But these Giza intelligences that I've talked about before 
succeeded in taking possession of Hitler's being, and they used him for their dark and malicious purposes. Uh, the Giza intelligences, as I've said before, for thousands of years have deluded humans, deceived humans with miracles and visions of every kind. And they resided, up until the late 1970s, they resided far below the Giza Plateau in these 73,000-year-old cubicle constructions. The Meyer material says the, the Great Pyramid itself was also 73,000 years old and was designed by extraterrestrial humans who came here from Orion. Uh, these Giza intelligences were related to the Playaren. They are a splinter group of the Playaren. They're also called the Bafath, and a, they are a group of human that desired since very ancient times after the fall of Atlantis and Lemuria about 11,500 years ago, they started their attempts to gain control of earthly humanity. Uh, they also attacked the Meyer group in 1978. They attacked the Semyasi Silver Star Center there in Hinterschmid Ruti. However, they were captured. The the Giza intelligences were captured. They were arrested, deported. They were stripped of all their technology. And they were incarcerated on a remote prison planet. And uh, I forget exactly how it all occurred, but they were killed, I think, when they tried to escape, something along those lines. Um, we are still under the effect of the telenotic impulse of these Giza intelligences. You remember I was talking about fine fluidal forces, and I, I imagine these telenotic impulses are also fine fluidal uh, forces. So these Giza intelligences, um, Billy got the opportunity to see their headquarters. He was taken down there by his second contact, Askett. And he saw these uh, artifacts that were um, imitations of the cross, of the crown of thorns, uh, of a blood-encrusted nail. And these Giza intelligences have a great technical ability to create these uh, imitations of these artifacts. And our scientists would have never known the difference. They would have dated them as having come from that time and everything. So the the Giza intelligences are a line of extraterrestrials, uh, which go all the way back to, like I said, 11,500 years ago. They started uh, with a man named Eris the 11th, and they come all the way forward. Uh, I won't go over all of that information again. S certainly probably will in maybe a future show. Uh, the Thule Society is was the vehicle through which the Giza intelligences affected uh, Hitler. And they used a man in the Thule Society or the Thule Society named Hermann Steinschneider who influenced Hitler. During that time, he, he, ha he went under another name called Eric Jan Hannesen. And he was the one that kind of uh, threw Hitler off his path, his his normal path. So one one of the questions that you might ask yourself is 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 why why does the Meyer material have so much information and and why is it so important to learn so much? And that is related to the purpose for our life and and what we're doing down here on the earth. Uh, the purpose of our life is evolving our consciousness and evolving. So that's why we have so many problems right now, because we're kind of hung up on the earth. We're, we're not evolving as we should. And so we're doing so many things that are against these 
creational natural laws, like having a gigantic population that's just growing out of control um, by not functioning under uh, the first creational natural law, which is the law of love, which we talked about the last show. So there's all of these um, creational natural laws like the law of harmony, which teaches us to think in a neutral, positive form. So when you don't follow these laws, you end up with disasters. And the prophecies of the Meyer material are really uh, telling us about the potential disasters that are coming. And in Contact Report 215 is probably the some of the clearest examples of coming possible disasters, horrifying weapons and possible world war. And in Contact 215 it says, due to the fault of scientists, enormous powers will be seized by the power hungry and their military, their warriors and terrorists. Power will be seized as well through laser weapons of many types, but also through atomic, chemical, and biological weapons. Also concerning genetic technology, enormous misuse will occur because this will be unrestrainedly exploited for the purposes of war, not lastly due to cloning of human beings for warring purposes. So we will have cloned human armies at some point. As this was practiced in ancient times with the descendants of Hanok in the regions of Sirith, However, this will not be all of the horrors, as besides, um, more deadly weapons of mass destruction will be produced and will be used. The irresponsible politicians will unscrupulously exercise their power, assisted by scientists and obedient military forces serving them, who together hold a deadly scepter and will create clone-like beings which will breed in a total lack of conscious and will be scientifically manipulated to be killer machines. So this is what we're going to face. I don't know how far away we are from that. And just between me and you, I wonder if there isn't a Hillary Clinton clone or a Hillary Clinton double or more than one of them. Division by division and devoid of any feelings, these clones will be devoid of any feelings. They will destroy, murder, and annihilate everything. The USA will set out against the eastern countries ahead of all their financial states, and simultaneously she will have to defend herself against the eastern intruders. And this, there are this dark order that the Meyer material just kind of briefly mentions in uh, a few pages worth, worth of material in the Goblet of Truth. The dark order um, uses what's called the Hegelian dialectic. In other words, they create a problem so that they can offer their solution to the problem. And you'll notice uh, the, the elite are offering solutions that always take away our freedom because they want a weakened and destroyed United States so that they can bring in their global government, which is a technocracy. It's a tyranny. Let me continue here in the Henna prophecies. In all, America will play the most decisive role when in the guise to strive for peace and to fight against terrorism, she invades many countries on the earth. This has already happened. She bombs and destroys everything and brings thousandfold death to the populations. The military politics of the USA likewise know no limits, as neither will their economic and other political institutions, which will be focused on building and operating a world police force. As it is the case already for a long time. But this will be not enough 
in the guise of so-called peaceful globalizations. It's the globalists who are behind all of this. Um, and I don't know if you've been watching what's going on with the EU, but the people have risen up against this uh, globalist group that wanted to break down all the, the national borders in the EU. And, and the Europeans are fighting against it, and they call it Brexit. It's fighting against this uh, European globalist uh, attempt to just make one giant uh, group out of the Europeans. In any case, so there's some signs that some good things are happening. Okay, so American politics will aspire to gain control of the world concerning supremacy in economy. And this will point towards the possibility that a third world war could develop. And uh, we are provoking Russia. We've brought missiles very close to the... uh, to the uh, border of Russia. In any case, we are much closer to World War III. And this will point towards the possibility that a third world war could develop from it. If human beings as a whole will not finally reflect upon reason, become reasonable, and undertake the necessary steps against the insane machinations of their governments. And I think the current election, we're seeing the battle. Uh, I believe um, the Clinton family is representing the globalists. They are uh, the minions of the global elite, in my opinion. Um, Anyway, let's continue here. Undertake the necessary steps against the insane machinations of their governments and military powers as well as their secret services and call a halt to the power of the irresponsible who have forsaken their responsibility in all areas. And um, I've been reading a book. If you listen to the beginning of the last show, um, it's called Clinton's War on Women. And it has a, a little section in there where Bill Clinton is bombed out of his mind on cocaine and he kind of stumbles. He's leaning against the wall and he stumbles and falls into a garbage can. (laughs) And he's just, I guess, stuck in this garbage can. It's just such a symbolic thing. Um, It's written by Roger Stone and another author. And it's really a good book. Maybe I'll uh, cover that again, I hope, in, in future shows. Okay. If we're not able to stop this trend, and again, I'm reading from Contact Report 215. um, If we're not able to stop this trend, the Meyer material says the small and the great nations will lose their independence. They will lose their cultural identity, and that's what's happening now. They've intentionally uh, destroyed Syria, practically. And now the Syrian immigrants are fleeing into Russia, into into Europe, and creating chaos because their culture does not mix with the European culture, and all of this craziness that comes from the left, where they say, "Oh, you're just xenophobic and you're Islamophobic." No, their culture does not mix with ours, and we're going to have tremendous conflicts because of this. Okay, let's continue. If this does not happen, many small and great nations will lose their independence and their cultural identity and will be beaten down because the USA will gain predominance over them. And with evil force will bring them down under her rule. At first, many countries will howl with the wolves of the U.S., partially due to the fear of American aggressions and sanctions, as will be the case with many irresponsible ones in Switzerland and in Germany but also other countries. In part, others will join in because they will be forced somehow to do so and be misled by the irresponsible promoters of the American propaganda. So what we're seeing now in the American political scene is pure propaganda, particularly from the mainstream media. If we don't stop this, 
trend, we're going to be in very, very serious trouble. And hopefully, I'm hoping that somehow we're going to turn things around. I still have some hope there. Well, if if you're listening to this show in archive and you're relatively new, you're probably kind of overwhelmed because I've been throwing a flood of information at you today. So let's take a step back for just a few minutes and let me talk a little bit about who Billy Meyer is. And, uh, the Meyer material says that Edward Albert Meyer is the seventh incarnation of a very ancient spirit form who has been incarnating on the earth for the last 10 to 13,000 years. And he has been the people that we call Enoch, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Emmanuel, and Muhammad. And in each one of these lifetimes, he's taught something called the teaching of the Spirit. And I believe he kind of tailors it in each lifetime to the people of that time and taught it in a way that was understandable. In this lifetime, he's writing this material down because we're literate. We are a society generally that's literate. There are many people that can read in, uh, in Europe and in the United States and in South America and in Canada. So it's time now where this can be written down, and it's called the teaching of the Spirit. Now, Billy grew up in Switzerland, in Bulak, Switzerland, in, uh, in northern Switzerland. And during that time, he started to get telepathic messages from a man named Svath. Now, Svath was an extraterrestrial man of about a thousand years old. He is a man who came from a star system called the Pleiaren star system. Not from the Pleiade, not from the Pleiades, but from the Pleiaren star system, which is some 80 light years beyond our Pleiades. And these human beings that live on a planet called Era are very much more highly advanced than we are. They're in the fifth stage of evolution. Uh, probably most of their society is. And there are seven evolutionary steps that human beings go through. We're da down at level two. So we're, we don't know how to use the swinging waves. We do not understand these fine fluidal powers that I was discussing, um, the fluidal forces of, of fine matter. These higher evolved human beings do. Now they're so much higher evolved than us that they're at a point where our societies are no longer compatible. They can't come down here and land and start talking to just anybody. Uh, if they do come in contact with normal Earth humans, they have to wear a special kind of technology which shields them from our thought vibrations. Our thought vibrations have so much ignorance within them that they, it causes a kind of uh, damage to these people where they lose control of their bodies. In any sense, Edward Albert Meyer, because his spirit form is so ancient, um, his spirit form they call Nocodamia because it's nine billion uh, 600 million years old, and it's lived on other galaxies and other worlds and has been the spiritual teacher of the Pleiaren in the past. Uh, he emigrated his spirit form in another lifetime, emigrated into the uh, Milky Way galaxy as Illyrian, and he's been a teacher in, in the very, very ancient past. So this spirit form incarnates in Switzerland. Uh, on Earth, as a small boy, 
named Edward Albert Meyer. Now, this extraterrestrial human, Sphoth, is part of this Nocodamian lineage. There's a lineage of people, so it's kind of a family type thing. Um, Sphoth was Billy's first mentor. Now, what happens in the reincarnation process, when you come back into physical life, you're a child. Now, within your subconscious might be this tremendous wisdom from these previous personalities, but you've got to kind of grow up again. And your material consciousness is brand new on every rebirth, on every reincarnation. So the child has to be educated again. Now, he'll be impulsed by these subconscious memories. Also, the storage banks, the universe has storage banks of information. So since Billy was growing up in Niterflok slash Bulak, which is in the Glatt Valley, uh, and, and these storage banks are filled with information, okay, in the universe. And Billy's spirit form is very ancient, so it's very sensitive to the information in these storage banks. So as a young boy, about 3 a.m. One, one morning, he crawls out a lower window in his bedroom, goes and sits on a bench and looks up at a very beautiful starry night. And he's overwhelmed by what he's seeing. And it, it, he, he hears a, a voice uh, in his head, almost like uh, one of his previous personalities uh, starts to assert itself. And he says, uh, since ancient times, I lived among the stars. And he saw the visible light, which the stars emitted. But there was an invisible light, which he called the radiating love of creation. So Billy's, he's starting to get these, these impulses from what are called the storage banks. And he's getting impulses related to his previous life um, and it's very interesting because one of Billy's previous lives was a man named Emmanuel and, and maybe we'll go into this in a little bit more depth tonight uh, Emmanuel was the real person, according to my material, the real person uh, associated with the story that we have in the New Testament about Jesus. And we, maybe I'll go a little bit tonight into uh, the name Jesus and, 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 and where that comes from and what that all means. But one of the things Emmanuel said was that he talked about creation. And imagine these people in the Middle East moving eastward in a caravan at night. And, and Emmanuel says, human beings should look upward to the stars for majestic peace and grandeur rule there. As though by immutable law and order, the infinite and everlasting changes take place over days, months, years, and for centuries, millennia, and millions of years. So Emmanuel is saying, look up at the sky, look at the starry night there, and meditate on these stars that have been up there for millions of years as, these, you know, as the time goes by. So Billy <coughs> is doing this again in this lifetime. You see, he's repeating uh, what Emmanuel did thousands of years before, and he's looking up to the stars. He's only four years old. And Billy heard this voice in his head again. These words form on his lips. It's his spirit form, which is very ancient. His material consciousness is a brand new child, just like any other child on the earth. But his spirit form is very ancient. And it says, since ancient times, you've lived among the stars. And Billy knew who he was. He knew where he'd come from. He knew his missions on the earth, and he felt all of these impulses 
And these impulses were from these universal storage banks. And he had all these good memories which penetrated him. Maybe he had memories of when he was Emmanuel, when he was on this caravan heading eastward in the Middle East and looking up at the maj- majestic uh, starry night. And uh, let me continue here in chapter 36 of the Talmud of Emmanuel. It says, Human beings, uh, no, excuse me, as though by immutable law and order, the infinite and everlasting changes take place there over days, months, years, and for centuries, millennia, and millions of years. And Emmanuel says, Human beings, however, should also look downward upon the earth, for there as well as is creational activity and endless becoming and passing away of life and existence toward ever newly developing life forms. There's a reference to reincarnation there. He continues, greatness, excellence, and beauty rule harmoniously where nature is left to itself. One of the things that the Meyer material says is the incredible splendor of nature is the visible expression of the love of creation. But where traces of human order are at work, there is pettiness, disgrace, ugliness, and they testify to an alarming disharmony. And that's what we have here on the earth. And I was talking about that in Contact Report 215. We have an alarming disharmony on the earth right now and an indifference. Uh, it says in the Goblet of Truth that we, under, we are now under a consciousness conditioned tyranny. And the elite are taking away our, our rights of self-determination. So we have this pettiness and the, um, we do not have harmony. Let's see what Emmanuel says here. He says, with inflated chest, the human being calls himself the crown of creation. And yet, he is not cognizant of creation, and he sets persons on a level with it. But this human being, who has tamed fire and rules the earth, will not go far. Without a doubt, human beings will learn to harness water and air, but in the process, they will forget to recognize creation above them and its laws. And Semyase said, one of Billy's contacts, that Love and wisdom go together. And the creation and its laws are love and wisdom at the same time. So nature has this excellence, this beauty, which rules harmoniously. But if we don't live according to nature's laws, we'll get out of harmony. And Emmanuel says, people in the future, they will forget to seek the truth. Knowledge, love, respect, life, logic, true freedom and wisdom. And they will forget to live peacefully with one another. And, and I believe it's Contact Report 260 which says, when the prophet of the new time comes, it's, and there's a paragraph every, every time, it says, when the prophet of the new time comes, men will be lovers of money. And it describes you know, what we are today, lovers of money. When the prophet of the new time comes, men will be at war, and it describes the warfare. When the prophet of the new time comes, men will be lovers of pleasure. And that's that's where we are now. Um, they will forget to live peacefully with each other. Their battle cry will be for warfare, for they want to attain power through violence. And we see... Um, George Soros, one of these globalists, paying money to this group, Black Lives Matter, to stir up this racial discord in the U.S. right now. This, again, is the Hegelian dialectic dialectic, to create a problem so the globalists can bring in their solution. It says here, Emmanuel says, many will degenerate into beasts and spend their earthly days without knowledge or conscience. Human ambitions and desires will be directed only toward acquisition, power, lust, addiction, and greed. 
With their intellect, human beings will arrange things of the world to make them subservient, regardless of the fact that in doing so, they will break the laws of nature and destroy nature in many ways. And the, the book, The Goblet of the Truth, says nature has been uh, destroyed. But even though it also says that no human being is fundamentally evil, uh, that we're not genetically programmed for evil. It says the abysses of evil, gewalt, uh, unhonesty, hatred, jealousy, falseness, these are something that human beings develop over the course of their lives. So these bad behavior patterns are not genetically programmed into us. Uh, evil is a word that can denote profound immorality. Uh, to program means to provide with coded instructions for automatic performance of a particular task. So we're not programmed for this kind of behavior. So these negative behavior patterns, though, are highly contagious. So if there's a small group of people that are behaving very badly, it tends to get passed to the masses. Contagious means tending to spread. So this behavior pattern, this violence, this lack of peace, spreads, has spread over the earth. And Emmanuel says that in the future, the human being will display an evil false mask. Many will degenerate into beasts, as it said. Um, with their intellect, human beings will arrange things of the world to make them subservient. We're destroying nature. We're, we're making it subservient to us. We no longer trust in eternal truths which are anchored in the laws of nature. Through self-deception, they will find more meaning in the human sciences than in all the values of the laws of nature and creation. And that's, that's a very sad um, thing. One of the things that Emmanuel says later that's, I think, very profound, he says, the body is a part of the spirit. They're not a duality, but they're one. And the everything physical comes from this spiritual realm and we're all really part of this great oneness. All of the physical universe that's 46 trillion years old right now, it's still expanding. It'll expand for 155 million years and then contract. It'll be one cycle of evolution for this universe. But it all came from the fine matter realm. So the, the trees, the plants, the birds, the animals all come from the spirit. You see, we're all one. We just don't understand that yet. So, unfortunately, right now we're very much influenced by the unconscious mind. And we have these unconscious um, reactions to things. And it's the, the brain stem which responds to these uh, what we consider threats. It continues here. Emmanuel says, in their confusion, human beings will believe in the erroneous, self-created, pathetic philosophy of life, which will be produced through the cult's erroneous teachings. Let me let me stop there. The cult's erroneous teachings. Now, the Meyer information is very. Um, hard on religion. And um, I want to go back to the Council of Nicaea where the Roman Emperor Constantine in AD 325 created this uh, meeting. Uh, he enacted, uh, Constantine enacted many administrative, financial, social, and military reforms to strengthen the empire the Roman Empire. What he wanted to do was make Christianity 
the church for the Roman Empire. And he started the first council of Nicaea. And at this point, the Roman aristocracy worshipped two Greek gods, Apollo and Zeus. Um, however, the most the common people idolized Julius Caesar or Mithras. Now, at this point, Christianity was illegal to even practice in the empire because Julius Caesar was hailed as God made manifest and the universal savior of human life. Sounds familiar. His successor, Augustus, was called the ancestral God and savior of the whole human race. So Augustus and Constantine, Julius Caesar, these people, uh, Julius Caesar and Augustus were worshipped as gods. Now, Constantine tried to bring together all the teachers of Christianity to so they, they could have a common doctrine. One of the things they had to come to agreement on, believe it or not, was the name of the Savior. Uh, Constantine's idea was to unite the Druid god Jesus with the Eastern Savior god Krishna, Jesus Krishna, and that would be the official name of the new Roman God. Now keep this in mind, Jesus Krishna, there's no letter J here because there were no letter J's in the ancient world. But, and this is not the Meyer material I'm telling you, this is other historical information. that said Jesus Krishna subsequently evolved into Jesus Christ, the name did. Um, so let me continue here. This, the Greek spelling for Jesus began with the letter I, but was pr- pronounced something like Jesus. Uh, uh, here's an int- there's an interesting art- article about the name Jesus. It's funny if you look into the old. Uh, King James, the original King James, 1611, you'll see the name I-E-S-V-S, Christ, not Jesus, because there was no letter J. The letter J was really, first of all, came about in about 1550 by a guy named Gian Giorgio Torissimo. He was making fancy eyes, and one of them came out like a J, and he said, hey, I like that, and um, that to see the J sound didn't even exist in any of the ancient languages of the Bible, not in the Greek, the Hebrew, the Aramaic. In fact, names like Job, it was really the book of Iob, probably pronounced Job, because the I's were often pronounced with a Y. Uh, the, the the real names of Jane and James and John are pretty much unpronounceable today. Um, they would pronounce uh, the name, what we call Jesus today, Jesus. Now, the Meyer material says his name was really Emmanuel, and you can trace Emmanuel back to the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah. I read another interesting article that said uh, in 1632 there was a court document in England that used the word Jesus, and that is one of the earliest times we can see that name used. Um, the letter J originated as a swash letter, a long I. A swash letter is a fancy letter. Uh, and if you look in the Old English, which goes back to the 12th or 13th century, there were no, there were no letter J in the Old English. That's why James, John, Job... Uh, For example, Julius Caesar, the name was pronounced with a Y, Julius. Very hard for us to pronounce. Uh, But in the old English alphabet, there was no letter J. We had A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I, K, L, M, N, O, P. There was no J. There was no H, I, J, K. Um, There was no letter J. And there's some very interesting, and I'll have to play them sometime, No books written in English before the letter 1600 
had the letter J in them, in no books, period, in any language. Uh, the names of James and John were unpronounceable, as far as I'm concerned, Yaakov and Yakunan. Uh, the letter J is the youngest letter in the alphabet. The letter J never existed until about 1600, again, with this fellow named G. and Giorgio Tarissino, who was a German scholar. Um, well, he was an Italian scholar that knew German, and he was the one that invented the letter J, so to speak. So... Uh, some say that Yeshua came, yes, became Jesus, which eventually became Jesus. The Meyer material, and that may be true, actually. That's maybe how we got to the name Jesus. But the Meyer material says this a man was originally named Emmanuel. So, according to the Meyer information, he was not originally called Yeshua. Uh, Emmanuel has the meaning, the one with godly knowledge, der mit gottlich Wissen, in the German. And the one with godly knowledge means the knowledge of an Ishwish, a king of wisdom. The Emmanuel is one of the first traditional first names in the Ur form. In other words, it means Emmanuel, with, and it has a letter J in it, was a very old name of the Lyrians or the Vagans who were here 300,000 years ago or something to that effect. And the story of the life of Emmanuel, the real story, is written in the book, The Talmud of Emmanuel. And what I'm reading to you are these little passages from uh, the Talmud of Emmanuel. Now, if you still doubt that he wasn't originally called Jesus, then look at the acronym INRI, which appears on all the paintings in, in, during the time of the Renaissance. Isis Nazarenus Rex Iodorium, I-N-R-I, which is an acronym, a Latin inscription, which we today say the word Jesus, the Nazarene king of the Jews, because we substitute the word Jesus for Jesus, or, which is um, spelled I-E-S-U-S or I-E-S-O-U-S. So... So in any case, um, I'm just about out of time, and I thought I would share some of this information with you. Um, I'll be back next week. I appreciate the folks that finally sh showed up in the chat room. Hope this was interesting. You've been listening to Ohio Exopolitics, and I should be back on Wednesday evening, same place, at 8 p.m. Eastern, Wednesday evening. We'll see you then. Have a good day. Good evening.